welcome back guys it's your boy the ace hitting you up with another c2 now today's topic of discussion is sliver now sliver is a bishop fox project and they describe it themselves as an open source cross-platform adversary emulation slash red team framework now this is primarily written in go and it targets windows linux mac any operating system that can essentially run its binaries although Bishop Fox themselves don't maintain a guarantee to that. Having said that, Sliver supports multi-user operations including multi-C2 channels, all with encryption baked in, pivot in buffs and more. Bearing in mind this interface is completely text-based and it's originating from the Bishop Fox team. Now Sliver is a popular choice among red teamers for adversary emulation and learning tool for security enthusiasts. Now, from the stats, we can see that although Cobalt Strike is taking the market share in what we are seeing in the wild in terms of threat actors, people are becoming more interested in Sliver and how versatile it is, especially that it's open source and free. Sliver C2 framework has features catering both to beginners and advanced users. And this is one of its main attractions that it has the ability to generate dynamic payloads from multiple platforms like we mentioned these payloads or slivers provide capabilities like establishing persistence spawning shells and exfiltrating data when it comes to communication sliver supports a wide range of communication protocols including http https dns tcp wireguard and so much more this ensures that c2 traffic is flexible stealthy and can blend in with normal traffic loads I think that's enough information to take on for an intro perspective. So let's head over to the practical session and get hands on with this. So welcome to the practical session. So if we just dive into desktop and get this show on the road, we can first go into our browser and check the repository for Sliver and in turn Bishop Fox. Now, for those of you unfamiliar, Bishop Fox, who specialized in offensive security. If we click on about, we can see that as an overview, they are leading the charge in the cybersec space for over two decades. You can see that they are present at DEF CON and have a presence in the cybersec arena now as a free application and here is their team of course uh looks like co-founded by two individuals francis and vincent and many more staff under them on the github repo we have 78 releases to date with almost a thousand forks in the making now sliver as i just mentioned is a open repository and a formidable c2 framework from their own descriptions live as an open source cross-platform adversary emulations red slash red team framework it can be used by organizations of all sizes to perform security testing sliver implants we'll look at what this means later support c2 over mutual tls or MTLS, WireGuard, which we can also look at, HTTPS, DNS, and are dynamically compiled per binary asymmetric encryption keys. There's a lot to unpack there. Mostly their features are dynamic code generation, compile time, obfuscation, multiplayer mode, which is quite interesting. I'm seeing that more and more C2s. Stage and stages payloads, procedurally, generated c2 over https dns canary which is a blue team detection systems quite new uh secure c2 like i just mentioned and so on so they do have a one liner and i'm never for just firing curl commands to servers and installing them but in this instance and it is a sandbox environment we can do that so if you was to fire that command that will bring in all the repositories 
and dependencies that are required to install this application. We can see from the languages used on the code base that it's mostly programmed in Go, which is 98% of the code base. The rest is a mixture of Python, C, Docker, Rust, and Makefile. I've already fired that command and in the first instance that command works but I discovered an issue and I'm hoping what I show you now will resolve that issue for you so you can actually get started. So if we cd into sliver now if I type the word sliver as you can see it's highlighted which means is a code base recognized as an execution on my system that it can run. We shall see what happens. Now you can see here, I've got connecting to local host 31337. Then I get this error where it says connection to server failed, context deadline exceeded. Now on the repository itself, I looked up to see if this was an error and it is an error some people are having, but Diving through all of this, I could not find one fix around this. Uh, it was driving me mad to the point where I had to delay even making this video. So if we type in, let's say deadline exceeded. We can see here, some people are having that issue. Here, deadline context exceeded, connection saver context exceeded. You can see quite a few people are having it. We got Moloch also trying to help individuals and checking the firewall didn't help for me. I was having this issue left, right and center. Now to resolve this, and I will have the commands for you, but to resolve this, the first thing I did was first use this command. And I've, I mentioned this before in my other C2, but this pseudo system ctl and then the daemon i reloaded it so once i hit that command put your admin password in then what i did next was actually restart the sliver service so sudo again system ctl start then sliver dot service then that restarted the service and then Lastly, what I did was sudo service sliver start. And then again, that's starting the service up again. Now, if we hit sliver, we are in action. And I really hope that helped uh, someone out there that was facing that issue because for the life of me, that issue was causing so many delays in terms of running this application. I even destroyed a few boxes and rebuilt them just so that curl command can bring this back up for me. So let's carry on. Now we're in the sliver C2 framework. Now if we hit help, we have a few options available to us and it's quite a comprehensive C2 alongside mythic, I would say very comprehensive and very well documented and a great community behind it. So here we got these sorts of commands. We have clear, exit, help, monitor. We've got the WP commands for config, port forwarding and socks. Uh, now we can listen under the socks quite interesting. It says list the socks servers. It's listening on WireGuard and it runs it on the interface. Coincidentally, we have these generic commands as well. We got aliases armory which is a very interesting command so this automatically downloads and installs extensions and aliases and i'm going to show you that in a minute but essentially armory as you can think of a swiss army knife you can add on community work approved community work sometime third party unapproved to your c2 framework and bolster it on really as it were now we have background if you're familiar with uh, any interpreter kind of sessions you can run processes them back and forth and put them in the background and the foreground as you need we have these cursed which i haven't used yet but we might get into it the environment variable generate which generates an implant binary which we can use we also have these listeners and we have the implants themselves job controls 
very well documented. Even multiplayers, like I said, if you were to fire this up, you can have third parties join your red team in endeavors, as it were. So what we want to first start up is the MTLS, which is a listener. Now, I have one running already, and you can see it's bound on 8888 on TCP port, which is good. Now, this sets the stage for our generation. Now, we can generate either an implant or a beacon. Now, there's two distinctions between them, being that session implant sender what could be referred to like a heartbeat packet back to the server every few seconds, but will otherwise execute commands more or less interactively whereas beacons check in with the server at configurable intervals which makes them a more stealthier approach i would say as a result session implants are noisier and more susceptible to detection on the other hand the beacon and implementation of says like SOC 5 proxies and c2 pivots and port forwarding can allow different sorts of evasion tactics so in this example, we'll be just using the generic implant. Um, but if you did want a more stealthy approach, you could use the beacon approach as well as the SOC 5 proxies. So what we want to do to kick things off is generate and we can use the generate command. And I have one predefined here so we can generate and the MTLS listener will be on our IP address. So we just split this and then we do an if config, find our IP address, which will be this bad boy here. And that's fine. Next, we can save it onto desktop, give it the format of an exe file. Uh, it doesn't like these seconds. Maybe seconds is only determined for beacons. You can still do the jitter. It doesn't like that either. So jitter and seconds looks like they are only for beacon creation, not generic implants, but we can go with this one. Now, while that's compiling at this point, there's probably no point in turning on any sort of virus protection especially on you know, windows 11 host because it's going to be way too aggressive and with a default c2 such as sliver i'm sure binaries have been uploaded to virus total as assholes tend to do and the signatures are already been detected so generic implants or beacons will be picked up i'm pretty sure unless you're doing your own obfuscation of the code. And even at that point, you don't want to upload them. There's ways to check if you're going to bypass Defender, but I can go into that into another video, perhaps to kind of scan your binaries and your deploys before you actually go into a real environment with them. So as we can see here, the implant is saved and it just use a generic name past handmaiden um so that's it here right now so what we could do here is just fire up a up dog at this location my favorite application when it comes to self-network hosting of anything and we'll go back onto our machine now once we got up dog up and running we can see here we have our exe file so if we try to download that you can see here, we're getting the warning. We want to keep it, of course. Bearing in mind, detection has been disabled, so you can't blame Defender not picking this up. Uh, if we go into the file itself, uh, we could just run that. And Microsoft Defender still found it, even though it's been dismissed. And on this side of things, you can see here, we've got a session up and running. So if we go to sessions, there we have it. Our session is alive. We've got two forms of ID and essentially we are in that system. 
Now, what we want to do, as we do within a Meterpret shell, is sessions interact or interface. And then we could just hit a 07 to interface with this ID. And the connection was lost because Defender is still working even though it's turned off. So maybe we need to turn everything off. Let's just turn it all off. And make sure this demo can run smoothly. Of course, Defender picked it up. That's not questioning Defender in any case here. And everything is off now. So we can download that again. And we did end that up dog session, unfortunately. So let's just reignite that. And download that once again. Keep it. Yes. Run it. Yes, run that. Interesting. Now here, you can you see here, it's picking it up as a virtual win 32 sliver. Uh, it's already known, like I just said. So we can allow it on the device just to keep things rolling. But like I mentioned earlier, a default payload of this type definitely going to be picked up. And I think we're back in action now. Yeah. So if we interface with I and we write just DC. And now it looks like we have an active session happening. So if we type a uh, classic Jackie Chan, who am I? And we are the ace on the aces machine. Essentially at this point it is game over. If the implant was able to be deployed. But as we saw, especially on the Windows 11 box fully updated to date. It completely obliterated it. It knew exactly what it was. It knew it was a virus and it was from Sliver. So all the markers of the default ones are there, unfortunately. So if you are trying to deploy something like this, it won't work in a live environment, which is where the skill comes in. Check out HD, of course, for that. Now, let's look at some other commands we can use post-exploitation wise. So we can use the PS command, which will give us a PID value of all the applications that are running on the host machine or the victim's machine. We also get the git privs command, which I find quite nice. What I like here as well, when you run that uh, PS command, if you can see here, it's got seven pages. So if you want to continue through them, you can keep going. Uh, and at the very end, you can see here, it gives you a security product which some people don't cover or even know about. It gives you the fact that it has Windows Defender and Windows Smart Screen available on the machine that you're on. Also, if you were savvy to the situation, you can see here it gives you the PID ID under which your EXE is actually running. Um, so it's not a case that it's not leaving any footprints or data footprints behind it is it is running but it gives you these obscure names so sometimes someone wouldn't know exactly what they're looking for which gets quite nice the next one i want to try is the git privs git p-r-i-v-s okay git privs all right so we can hear we can see that the process integrity level is at the highest level um which 
kind of means we can execute at a in a system level if need be and we can potentially pivot around the system we can do this by getting a we can get the uid also um we can get the gid if we wanted and we can as we just saw we can get the pid so we can get the process id of what we're running like i mentioned earlier here where is that which was here that eight seven one six and that's exactly the id we're running here we can list the implants as well here are past implants i've had in sessions that have run and it tells you the format in which they are deployed as well there's literally so much commands available to us at this point we could download a file of course change ownership of files cat files out make them available to us we can even start an interactive shell take a screenshot and see what that looks like okay there we have it pretty good usual things all right so we got the screenshot let's clear that next thing i want to test out is the armory now the armory as we can see here is fetching dynamically a list of indexed armories now these armories are essentially a set of tools that you can pull in now you can see here all these ones in green are ones that i've downloaded specifically for my sliver but you can see here there's a few dozen here that you can and there's more description about the bundles now this windows bypass is quite nice because essentially you want to try bypass the uac to inject whatever you want which is pretty nice you got windows pivot as well and the way this works you would type armory and then you would type the word install um and then install whichever package you want to install here like these ones here any ones uh i'm not sure you can install this one as it's a bundle but we can give it a shot and believe it or not it is doing it so this one provides as a bundle inject etw bypass msi bypass and then unhook both and you can see here it's installing the various applications now bearing in mind each application within github somewhere has its own documentation repository so you can spend an entire week or month just grinding through all of this one by one the next command I want to show you is the git system and now if we do a dash h we have it spawns a new sliver session as the nt authority on windows system only now nt authority is basically full ownership uh, as a system admin on that particular machine now if I was to type uh, this with a different sort of technique we can have a timeout um we can also do a system process injection but in this instance if we just do the git system as we ran the initial implant as an admin we should be able to spawn a new session and system now here we can see there's a new session spawned under this 8de now that's separate from what we had before so if we go into these sessions we can see here we have two different sessions available to us under the NT authority system. This is full ownership. So if we go into that, hit I and then 8D, now we can see we're changing into a different session. And then if we get privs under here, it's fully game over now. We are process integrities of the highest caliber we have attributes to set and do anything within the system and you can see here we can bypass traverse checking anything now this is not to say all of these 
elevations that we're doing go without being seen on the system machine that's far from it if we were to check say the event log you may see some artifacts being left behind to all the actions that are being done but again if you're none the wiser to see how these processes are running and requests are being made um your system is fully owned by someone else and you yourself do not know what is going on on the system now if you see here there are certain tasks that are running under the security for special logons which you need to be aware of why would the system need to log in as a special logon and for ace to request these logons as well as you can see here target domain nt authority on the system i think the last thing i want to show is the shell command now here is a little toast to the 90s where this action is a bad upset and asking if you're an adult to do it and of course we are and we all but you can see here it's waiting for 10 seconds and then hit enter opens a shell tunnel and it started a remote shell under the pid id 8868 so once you hit this shell command i think from a process level at least on the user front it's fully kind of giving your hand and showing exactly what you're doing on that system now if we go into details we can obviously see the PID number that we said it was launched on which is 8868 now if we go into 8868 we can see here it's actually running under a power shell and it's taking a lot of memory to run this so one distinct point is if PowerShell is running and you're actually not running it and it's taking up quite a significant amount of resources, that is a telltale sign that something's gone astray on your machine. I think that's where I'm going to stop it with Sliver. It's been quite educational on my front and I'm still working with it, but it's definitely one of my favourites so far.